Today we're going to cover the other pattern of infection uh, that we started last time, and today it's persistent infection. So let's compare this to acute infections, which we talked about last time. Remember, acute infections are relatively rapid, but the key is self-limiting. They're over in a certain amount of time. You clear them before your life ends, hopefully. Uh, although I guess you could get a persistent infection, in, uh, an acute infection in your 80s and then die, but that doesn't really count. And in contrast, what we're going to talk about today, persistent infections are long-term. They last your whole life. You get them as a baby or an adolescent or a teenager or an adult. They stay with you the rest of your life. That's what we're going to talk about today. And typically, their character, the pattern of persistence, and this is how they work, basically, how they work to stay around for a long time. This is characteristic for each virus family or for a virus within each family. And you'll see we're going to talk a lot about the herpes viridae, the herpes virus family today. You'll see a lot of common themes. And as I said last time, I think that most persistent infections begin with an acute infection that is never cleared. So you actually have the, the signs of an acute infection, virus-produced symptoms, or even asymptomatic. And then most of the virus is gone, but some remains, and that stays with you the rest of your life. And this will be very clear today. I'm going to give you a number of examples of persistent infections so that you can see exactly the difference with an acute infection. So here's the graph that I showed to you last time. Study it. OK? Study it. <laughs> it's not much to study. This is an acute infection up here we talked about last time. We're looking at virus production in the blue line and disease is the little red bar. So in an acute infection, here's the lifetime of the host time. And here's blip, virus production, disease, and it's done. And these are all the, some of the acute infections that we talked about last time. These other three panels are all examples of persistent infections where virus is with you for the lifetime. And there are different patterns of persistence. It's not so crucial that uh, you know that. The most important point is that the virus is with the host forever in one form or another. So there can be lots of virus produced for a long period of time. So virus is always replicating. It's not cleared. And there's no pathology until the end where you see death here. Yes? The third graph. All right. So the reason it's not multiple acute infections is because this one, you're infected with virus, and then that virus remains in you, silent, and then it bursts up out every now and then, sometimes with disease and sometimes without. So the genome is in you, so that by definition is part of persistence. You never get rid of the genome. So that's the key. Acute. If these were an independent acute infections, you'd have to clear them each time. But you don't. The genome remains, or uh, genome and viral proteins remain. So that means that you can't tell based on the graph. So like an acute infection, it also looks like that. Because we're only measuring virus production. <laughs> That's a good question. You can't tell by this graph what's an acute infection. Um, you can tell in one way there's one acute infection here, and these are all multiple, so they're not acute infections. Okay? These are, I mean, you're right. If I didn't have any of the viruses on the right here, you wouldn't know that this is a herpes infection, so it's not acute. It's multiple persistent infections. But um, the way we've drawn it is to point out that these are persistent infections, and you just have to know that, and this is the, the one acute infection. I understand it's a little murky, but the, the real key here is that in all of these uh, panels two, three, and four, the genome is always present. It's not cleared, and that's the definition of an acute infection. You clear it. But yes, if I just showed you this, this could be four different viruses, but it's not. I'm telling you that it's herpes virus. Was there another question here? OK. All right. Um, and so there are different patterns. Virus can be present always. Uh, virus can be present initially uh, and then go uh, seemingly go away. But the genomes remain. And then periodically, you have reactivation. This is a word we're going to come back to, sometimes with disease and sometimes without. And this is characteristic of the herpes simplex viruses that we will talk about. The genome is always present. It was never cleared. Hence, it's a persistent infection. And then at the bottom, 
are some very long-term infections. You initially have an acute infection. Virus is present at very low levels for years, sometimes 10 or 20 years. Uh, and then at the end, the virus levels rise and you have death. This is typical of HIV and a couple of other viruses. And we'll, we'll talk about this pattern, HIV in, in particular, in a lecture of its own towards the end of the course. Yes? No, you're not sick. Only sick. Red is sick. Okay. So, so you're well for this whole period of time. Yeah. And how long would that period of time be? Could that be like 30 or 40 years? Well, this particular virus is a, is a mouse virus. So, you know, mice only live for two, <laughs> two to three years. So that's it for them. Uh, this virus does infect people, but only uh, causes disease if they're immunocompromised. It's been isolated from people who have been immunosuppressed for, for organ transplants. So, but in people, we, you, can have, um, you could have a virus in you for 20 or 30 years and be perfectly well, and then if you get immunosuppressed, then you, that infection could out of, get out of control and you can die from it. So a similar pattern. No disease for 20 or 30 years, immunosuppressed for a transplant, or what other virus immunosuppresses you? HIV. HIV. What other? Measles. Measles. So you could get a measles infection and then get immunosuppressed and die of it. So you could have this pattern. Okay. All right. Um, a couple of general points about persistent infections. As I said before, they're often a result when an acute infection is not cleared by the immune system. And, and many of the examples you'll see today, actually, much of the acute infection is cleared, and there are just a few cells left that remain infected, and that, for some reason, keeps the virus in you uh, forever. Um, sometimes we have genomes present only. Sometimes there's some viral proteins. And sometimes there is virus produced for the entire persistent infection. So there are different levels, as I showed you in that previous uh, graph. And some, and the herpes viruses in particular, you'll see the genomes are present, no proteins are made. They're completely silenced. And then at intervals, they're activated and more proteins are made. There isn't a typical single mechanism, as far as we can see, of persistence. Every virus I'm going to tell you about today has a different mechanism uh, of persistence. But in general, if the virus is not cytopathic and if we have uh, reduced immune responses, this is the recipe for a persistent infection. Now, you may have reduced immune responses because you're immunosuppressed, but most of us are not. Most of us who get infected uh, at birth with herpes virus as well. At birth, you are immunosuppressed to a certain extent, but uh, infections that occur other times are because the virus is modulating the immune response very effectively, and that's a major reason for persistence. We talked a little bit about viral uh, immune modulatory mechanisms a couple of lectures ago. I'm just going to go over some of them briefly today to emphasize that this is really important for establishing a persistent infection. A lot of these large DNA viruses that have, that establish persistent infections have immune modulators encoded in their genomes. And it could very well be that the majority of infected cells are initially cleared in that first acute infection. There may be a handful remain, and that's enough to establish persistence. In general, we really don't know a lot. People have been working on persistent infections for decades. But the problem is that these are things that happen in a host, in humans. It's very hard to study them. We don't have good animal models. The animal models that we have do some things that resemble persistence and reactivation, but they're animal models. We don't know if they apply to people. Here is a list of some persistent human infections, just to give you an idea of the range. We're going to talk about the ones that are asterisks today. So you can see, besides the ones we'll talk about, we have adenoviruses. Uh, another kind of uh, a virus related to HIV, HTLV-1, papillomaviruses, rubella virus, and then all the others. And on this graph, which is a nice uh, table, which is a nice summary, you have where the virus persists. I'm going to try and go over this when I talk about e individual ones, but I may miss some of the tissues. You can see they're quite varied. These are where the virus persists in you for years and years. And here are the consequences uh, of persistence. And in some cases, we have none, and others, we have a variety of diseases, as you can see, and I'll go through some of these in a moment. I just want to talk briefly about immune evasion again. Uh, this is really important for persistence. 
And a big target of immune evasion is this killing of infected self cells. So here we have an infected cell. Uh, and it is displaying um, a viral peptide on the surface in an MHC molecule. And if this is a CTL, which, uh, which MHC is displaying this? Do you remember? MHC1, right, because the product is 8. And um, the way this peptide is displayed, we talked about there are many, many ways that viruses have to antagonize peptide display so that infected cells cannot be lice. And again, this only has to happen in probably a handful of cells in order for persistence to be established. So here is MHC1 presentation, antigen presentation. Uh, here viral proteins are being made in the cell, of course, in the cytoplasm. They're being processed by that big, uh, what is the thing in your sink uh, that grinds up garbage? Garbage what? Thank you. Jeez. Garbage disposal. High tech stuff here, I can't remember. Uh, the garbage disposal of the cell chops up the, pept the protein. You get little peptides. They're shipped into the ER by this uh, transporter and then loaded into the MHC. And on this graph are both inhibitory, that's in red. So when you see a, um, a red line with a bar, that means inhibitory. Okay, can you remember that? And a green line means stimulatory. This is a, this is a universal thing, but I want you to know that for reasons who can, who can know, right? Um, and these are inhibitory and stimulatory steps. So we know, I've told you this before, that viral proteins can inhibit the transport of peptides uh, through the transporter to the MHC. They can inhibit transport of MHC to the cell surface. These green uh, lines here, these two viral proteins, one of HIV and one of CMV, they stimulate the downregulation of the MHC from the cell surface. That means they make it come in the cell so it's no longer displayed, and that's a good way to be evasive, of course. We went over a few of these before. Uh, there's inhibitors of transcription of the MHC genes, of course. Here is a uh, CMV cytomegalovirus gene that stimulates the uh, removal of MHC from the ER and puts it into the proteasome so it gets degraded. So you see, these are a lot of herpes viruses that are doing that, a CMV, a HSV, then you also have HIV in here as well, viruses that cause persistent infections, and this is a really important part of it. We also talked last time about ways viruses can evade immune responses. We talked about evading antibody responses by making changes in the virus that are the, in the places where the virus reacts with antibodies. Remember, antibodies can bind virus particles to neutralize their infectivity. We can also have evasion at the level of peptide display. So again, here's our infected self cell displaying a viral peptide in MHC1. Uh, as the infection proceeds, the virus can evolve to change this peptide so that infected cells are no longer recognized. You can imagine that the virus just makes a whole range of peptides and the ones that aren't recognized well by CTLs are the ones that survive and those viruses that encode them persist. And we know this CTL escape mutants, what these are called, occurs for herpes simplex as well as hepatitis C virus. These are two viruses that establish persistent infections that we're going to talk about today. There's another very neat way of viruses avoiding CTL killing. All right, we've been talking about interfering with antigen display in MHC1. This one is to actually kill the CTL before it kills you. So a CTL, as we've seen in two slides, uh, recognizes uh, MHC presenting a viral peptide. Then it kills that cell. It, it delivers materials that cause apoptosis and cell lysis. This, the CTLs have on their surfaces receptors for death proteins. There are three of them sh shown here, and they bind different ligands. Tumor necrosis factor is one of them. Fast ligand is another, and APO2D. The names aren't important, but the, these proteins, when they bind these ligands, induce programmed cell death. And, and this is present to modulate CTLs in us. So when CTLs get to a high level and they need to be turned down, we release FAS or TNF alpha and it kills the CTLs. Well, viruses have figured this out. And uh, viruses, uh, HIV and cytomegalovirus, when they infect cells, one of the things they do is induce the production of FAS ligand. All right, so when the CTL comes to this virus infected cell, it's immediately killed before it can kill the infected cell. Isn't that amazing? Uh, 
And so that's another way of getting rid of the CTLs. Um, you'll see in a moment, you look confused, you're okay? All right. In a moment, you're gonna see that this is a way of regulating CTLs in privileged compartments like the eye where you don't wanna have CTLs because they'll kill cells and you don't wanna kill your eye cells, right? Not, nor do you wanna kill uh, neurons. So in certain compartments, we don't allow CTLs to exist. They're gotten rid of via these fast ligand mainly, which is present at higher levels, for example, on eye cells. So that brings me to compartments that are privileged or have reduced immune surveillance. Not every cell in our body has the same level of immune surveillance because I think, or I hope as you've learned so far in this course, the immune response can be quite dangerous, can damage tissues. And there's no way to get around that. To get rid of infections, you have to cause damage. So these areas, the central nervous system, uh, the vitreous humor of the eye, uh, and other lymphoid areas in our body uh, don't have a, a great immune response because you don't want to cause damage. Uh, CNS in particular, because there are non-renewable cells there, so you don't want to kill them. So the eye, for example, the cells that make up the eye have high levels of fast ligand on their surface. So that means if a CTL happened to get in there and felt like killing one of your eye cells, then they can be infected the cell would be killed before it could do that because fast ligand, again, binds to the CTL and induces uh, apoptosis. So this is why you don't want to have an immune response in these kinds of tissues. These tissues are places where immune, uh, persistent infections often happen. The eye, the CNS, as you will see, because they don't have a great immune response for this reason. And finally, we talked about this before when we talked about immunosuppression. Many viruses that cause persistent infection infect cells of the immune system and they destroy them and that allows the viruses to maintain themselves in the host without being eliminated. So for example, HIV infects a whole range of immune cells, CD4 T cells, which of course are the helper cells that provide instruction to the T cells to differentiate into CTLs or to the B cells to differentiate to make antibody. They're incredibly important and that's why when you get HIV infections, you can't respond to other pathogens. You cannot make the proper immune response. They also infect monocytes and macrophages, dendritic cells. Remember the dendritic cells are incredibly important for presenting antigen to the lymph nodes and initiating an adaptive response. So this virus is infecting all the cells that we would need to get rid of it and that's why it persists, but many other viruses do the same things. Yep, it's up there. What, which of the following are features of persistent infections? All, all the uh, jokers are gone today, right? <laughs> okay, you're right, number, number five, all of the above. Figures, they're not here, right? You have to study. Um, yeah, all of these are features, as I've said, last a lifetime, viral immune modulation, immune cells can be infected and they occur in areas of reduced immune surveillance. All right, so let's talk about a few. I wanna start with viruses where, um, well, there's a couple of these viruses, the viruses are present throughout. This happens to be an exception, but I think we really don't understand this particular case of persistence. This is measles, which I mentioned uh, last time actually, because it causes an acute viral infection, the skin rash known as measles. This is an RNA virus with a negative strand RNA genome. It's enveloped and it's a, a paramyxovirus. Only infects people, no known animal reservoirs, so it is eradicatable. Um, it's, it's, as I said before, highly contagious. The reproductive index is 15 for this virus. Uh, and in 2011, 158,000 deaths globally. We do have a vaccine, so this is preventable. Uh, there is one serotype, you get lifelong immunity, so that coupled with uh, only humans being the host make it eradicable. And this is one of the viruses that causes immunosuppression because it infects cells of the immune system. Now, this causes the rash known as measles, which we have an outbreak of here in, in New York City, as you know. But a long-term uh, sequelae of measles is this disease called SSPE, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is a degenerative neurological disease. You basically get it six to eight years after you have measles and you, you undergo neurological degeneration, you lose motor functions and you eventually die. It's 100% fatal. And the rate is about one in a million cases of measles. 
Okay, so for every million kids who got measles, one of them will contract SSPE. Now, this is a form of a persistent infection because as far as we can set, tell, the viral nuclear protein, that's the protein that coats the RNA, you can find this in the brain of kids with SSPE. So it's been around a long time. Um, but we don't see infectious virus produced. So somehow having nuclear protein there is doing something that is causing the degeneration. There are viral genomes present, and we can see them spread between connected neurons. So they must be, of course, they have to be present to give rise to uh, the mRNA that uh, produces nuclear protein. But how they're maintained and in what particular cells, they obviously are in neurons is absolutely unknown. This is a really rare disease. There's no animal model to study it, so it's hard to make any headway. And to be frank, it is being, as we eliminate measles, it's going away. So there's less impetus to understand it, although I think it would be really important to know how this is working because it probably establishes some general principles of persistence. But uh, the fact remains is when measles was very prevalent, there was mo much more of this, of course, but now that the vaccine can eliminate it, it's less of a concern. So there, we don't have infectious virus. The genome is present, and maybe one protein is made, so it's silenced. And that'll be, that's sort of similar to some of the herpes viruses that you'll see later. Uh, the next persistent infections are caused by polyomaviruses. And these are small, double-stranded DNA-containing icosahedral viruses. Here's the capsid up there. We talked a lot about a particular polyomavirus in the first part of this course, SV40 because it was a model for DNA replication. The first origin was discovered in SV40 DNA, and we were able to use it to dissect DNA replication in vitro. Uh, since it was discovered, it was actually discovered as a contaminant of poliovirus vaccines in the 1960s, because polio vaccines were grown in monkey kidneys, and this is a virus that naturally infects monkeys. And so people didn't know about this virus. It didn't cause any uh, cytopathic effects in the cells, so it wasn't picked up until some smart investigator found it. So many millions of Americans got SV40 in the 60s. I might have gotten it, actually. I'm, I'm okay. I think most of them are okay, although there's been some concern that it caused cancer. Uh, we now know of about a dozen or more human polyomaviruses. And they're all with the red asterisks here. And there's a group up here, one, two, three, four of them. They're called the Wookiee viruses. It came from Star Wars. Now, the, the Wookiee stands for Wash U and uh, Carolina Institute. That's where the two viruses were isolated. Wookiee is a great name. So there's human polyomas viruses 6, 7, uh, the KI and WWU. And then we have uh, BK, JC. It's not Burger King. Okay, it's, uh, it's the initials of the patient. And this is the initials of the patient, too. I think this is John Cunningham. And then there's two others here. This is Merkel cell polyoma, which causes a rare skin tumor. And these are all found in people to great extents. We have lots of these viruses in them. We're all infected for life with these. We probably get them at or shortly after birth. Uh, and they infect a variety of organs depending on the specific virus of all those that I showed you, kidney, intestine, and respiratory tract. And a num BK, for example, infects the kidney. And I bet all of you have BK in your kidneys, and all of you are shedding 100,000 BK virions per milliliter uh, in your urine. And there's no effect on the kidney of this replication. It just keeps replicating. This is really an amazingly adapted virus, because we don't make any immune response to it. Well, we make antibodies, but we don't clear it. It doesn't damage our kidney. The only problems arise is when you are Exactly, when you get immunosuppressed. And now remember, we're doing a lot of uh, transplantation. When I was a kid, there was very little transplantation, but now we're doing it all the time for all sorts of organs, so we're immunosuppressing people to do that so the organ doesn't get rejected. And now we're seeing all these virus infections arising because we immunosuppress. This virus, BK, will go up to 10 million particles per million urine in an immunosuppressed patient. And sometimes that can cause kidney damage. So this is a real concern uh, in transplants. Uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. This is a degenerative brain disease caused by one of these polyomaviruses that happens to be 
uh, in the brain of many people, but when you get immunosuppressed, it causes this brain disease. And so a lot of people take a drug for multiple sclerosis, which immunosuppresses, and these patients get PML because the virus starts to replicate and causes brain pathology. So in normal hosts, these persistent infections are absolutely fine. But uh, in immunocompromised people, they can cause problems. And urine is not the only place. We probably have them in saliva, respiratory secretions. We probably shed them in the feces uh, as well. So they're ubiquitous, and so we all acquire them shortly after birth, and, and usually they're fine. Personally, I feel they're probably beneficial in some way. Um, but, of course, it's really hard to prove that. I, I think one day we're going to have broad-spectrum antivirals that get rid of all of our viruses that are in us. And then we'll see if these viruses are beneficial or not by, by the problems. <laughs> sort of like getting rid of your microbiome, your gut microbiome by antibiotic treatment during surgery. We now know this is really bad and can lead to bad bacteria colonizing the gut. Anyway, I talked to a guy on TWIV number 250 about this, who is, a, who is a physician who works, on, who has worked on these all these years. So, if you're interested in more, it's a really good conversation. Um, next virus, hepatitis B virus. We talked about this virus a while ago in terms of reverse transcription, which is one of the lectures you'll have on your test on Wednesday, of course. And this is a DNA virus that has a gapped, double-stranded DNA genome with a piece of RNA attached to it, and it's enveloped. And this virus is transmitted um, by exposure to blood, either at childbirth, if you get a contaminated transfusion in the old days before we knew to look for it, it was passed by the blood. Sexual activity will also transmit it. Drug use can also pick it up at a hospital if it's not properly decontaminated. The main target, as the name would, would indicate, is the hepatocyte, the liver cell. This virus goes to your liver and replicates there and uh, can cause problems. Um, most adults, when they pick this up, 95% can resolve the acute infection. So again, when you first encounter hepatitis B virus, you have an acute infection where the virus is replicating in the liver. You can get hepatitis, liver inflammation, you can get jaundice, for example. You can get liver enzymes released into the blood as a consequence. But most adults clear the infection. Most kids do not. Only 5 to 10% of newborns resolve the acute infection. So they are infected at birth from mothers who are viremic. They are chronically infected or persistently infected. Uh, and they're shedding virions, and they infect the newborn. Then the newborns, most of them become chronically infected. So in parts of the world where this virus is prevalent, uh, the transmission is still very intense to newborns because the infected mothers do it very effectively. So it's a real problem. So we have about 350 people, 50 million people with chronic HPV. So chronic is another word that's used to describe a persistent infection. There are, th two, uh, there are two words. Persistent can be called chronic or latent. And chronic usually means that there's virus produced all the time, and latent means that there's a genome present, but little or no virus. I, I don't worry about that too much. I'm just telling you because you're going to see the words, but I like persistent infection. It covers it all. When the problem with uh, chronic or persistent HBV is that it typically leads to liver cancer, which is fatal. All right, so all these people are at high risk for chronic HBV. We do have a vaccine, which is pretty good at preventing infection, but we have lots of people out there who are already infected, and getting them cured is difficult. Uh, the antivirals we have don't work all that well. So here, is a, here are two graphs that illustrate acute hepatitis B versus chronic. So here we're looking at uh, various indicators of viral infection on the y-axis with weeks post-exposure. And look at, first you can see symptoms fall into a very defined area in acute uh, hepatitis B. Uh, you have viral DNA replicating. Here's HBV DNA in green. Uh, here's a liver uh, enzyme being released into the bloodstream from the liver. That's indicative of liver cells being damaged because normally the levels are low. And then some viral antigens, the surface antigen, the glycoprotein. You can see peaks here. Uh, and then the antibodies, of course, go up. Those are the other curves. So it's a very defined uh, disease, disease, all right? The virus comes and goes. You have a defined symptom. And then after so many weeks, the, the infection's over. So that's an acute infection. But then, as I said, a number of individuals 
cannot clear the infection, and that's the pattern shown on the right graph. You have, again, the initial acute infection with your symptoms that are resolved, uh, but look, the viral genomes stay with you forever. They go on for your life, and the viral proteins go on forever. They're not cleared. They don't resolve as they do here. So that's the chronic hepatitis B that is problematic. Now, the vi interestingly, the virus is not cytopathic for cells. It doesn't kill liver cells. The liver disease that we see in people infected with hep B is entirely immunopathological. It's caused by CTLs killing infected hepatocytes. Uh, now, and again, in most people, this is not a problem. You resolve the infection and the, the liver regenerates and you're fine. But if you have chronic infection, then you have continuous damage of the liver. The liver begins to get scarred. Uh, it gets fibrotic as, as scar tissue fills in, eventually becomes cirrhotic, which is a highly damaged liver. And you can get liver failure just from cirrhotic liver on itself without even progressing to liver cancer. But then if you have this for 20 to 30 years, and that's typically the chronic uh, pattern of infection, you develop hepatocellular carcinoma. And you can have this for 20 or 30 years without symptoms. That initial acute infection is the most likely to give you jaundice and liver enzymes in the blood. But after that, you're fine, but your liver is slowly being destroyed. There's virus replicating in it. It's becoming fibrotic, cirrhotic, and eventually it develops uh, cancer. The mechanism of cancer development is really not clear. It's been suggested that the damage is part of it continuous cell damage and regeneration. It's been suggested that the virus uh, integrates next to oncogenes, but these are all things that haven't been proven yet. So Hep B is a big global problem, and in countries where it's chronic and there are so many millions of people, it keeps being transmitted to new hosts, and uh, we have to figure out a way to, to prevent that. There's another virus that targets the liver, hepatitis C virus, and this is an entirely different kind of virus. This is an RNA virus, a plus-stranded RNA virus. It's a member of the Flaviviridae family, which has viruses in it like uh, yellow fever and West Nile virus that we talked about last time. It's uh, got a icosahedral capsid surrounding the genome, and then around the capsid is an envelope uh, with glycoproteins uh, in the um, envelope. Now, unlike yellow fever or West Nile, this is not spread by what? What spreads West yes. Nile? mosquitoes. This is spread not by mosquitoes, but by people. Uh, again, exposure to contaminated blood. Hepatitis B has a viremic stage. Hepatitis C has a viremic stage as it's replicating in the liver. So it's transmitted during sex, intravenous drug use using contaminated needles, and also during birth. In Egypt, um, a number of years ago in the 80s, the government uh, underwent a campaign to eliminate a parasitic infection by injecting people with an anti-parasitic drug. These, they used reusable needles, and they didn't clean them well. Now, like 60% of the country is HCV positive as a result. So they spread this infection from a few people who initially had it in Egypt to most of the country who got this anti-parasite drug. And we think a similar thing has happened to uh, spread HIV. We'll talk about that later. So 2.2% of the human population is infected with hepatitis C virus, 185 million people. And here we don't have a vaccine yet. We do have antiviral drugs. In fact, a couple have just been put on the market. We used to use interferon to treat people with hep C, but only a certain fraction of people ever responded to interferon, and interferon has such terrible side effects that it's really not a good treatment. We now have a couple of antivirals, but they cost $1,000 a pill for these new drugs, $150,000 a year to treat this disease. It is eradicatable with the drug, but who can afford this at that cost? I don't even think our healthcare system can bear it. So very interesting problems associated with these chronic infections. So this is a persistent infection. Not in everyone, again, just like hep B. Some people can clear it. Um, in the beginning, there's an acute infection. You, get, you acquire HCV in some means, by drugs or sex or at birth. You may have a symptomatic phase where you have symptoms of hepatitis, which again are jaundice and release of enzymes into the bloodstream. But many infections are asymptomatic. Uh, the virus is cleared. So 
uh, 15 to 40 percent of acute infections resolve. They're cleared and that's the end. You never have the virus again. But 60 to 85 percent uh, undergo chronic infection. The virus circulates. It's produced continuously by liver cells. It's in the blood so you can spread it to other people. Uh, often you don't have any symptoms so you can easily infect uh, other people. Uh, and eventually this progresses through cirrhosis. Not everyone gets cirrhotic. Five to 20% of those with chronic infection get cirrhotic. And then at a rate of about 7% a year, uh, these individuals get uh, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So again, we don't understand the mechanism by which this virus causes liver cancer, but here we, we suspect that it's the continu continuous destruction and, re and renewal uh, of the liver cells. So chronic, Persistent replication, high level viremia, failure to clear the infection. So this is a persistent infection. And again, the, the interesting thing is that um, ev not everyone gets persistently infected. Some do and some don't. So if you have a population of people and some get infected and some don't, what could you do with them to figure out why? What's the difference? Yeah, you sequence their genomes, genome-wide association studies, right? And you see if something goes along with not resolving hep C. So you get chronically infected people and you sequence their genomes. And what people have found is that mutations in the interferon system seem to be really important. Uh, and in fact, clearance is associated with particular alleles of interferon lambda 3. So there are interferon alpha, beta, lambda, uh, and uh, gamma and epsilon. We haven't talked about most of them, but this is a particular kind of interferon. And these individuals who, cr who clear have very specific alleles. And there are mutations in these that are associated with chronicity. And this is a relatively recent finding done with uh, GWAS. We also believe that, so this virus has an amazing array of immune modulation mechanisms. It, it, it interferes with uh, sensing of its RNA genome. It interferes with cytoplasmic helicase function and signal transduction leading to interferon production. So we think that that plays a role in it as well, but I, there were some recent papers that have shown that the interferon lambda genotype is really important. This is a very uh, informative graph of the uh, mortality rate per 100,000 in the U.S. of uh, hepatitis B and C and HIV from 1999 to 2000. You can see in the U.S. the mortality rate for hep B is declining. We've, we immunized most kids with hep B. You should immunize kids. All my kids were immunized with, with hep B. And if you work in a lab, you definitely should be immunized because it could be present in some human cells. So we're really uh, turning down the incidence of mortality. These are people who have been infected for many years. They're dying and once they're gone, there shouldn't be any more infections. Uh, HIV death is declining in the U.S. as well, as new infections are declining, and we can treat people with antiretrovirals and they can live longer. But look, the hep C death is rising, and in fact now it's greater than that of HIV uh, in the U.S. because we have a large population of people who are infected. Now the new drugs should help, but as I said, they're so expensive. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what, what an impact it's going to make on uh, this disease. Yeah. Is, um the fact that there's a specific allele um, about interferon uh, associated with the HCV clearance, would that make it a good um, candidate for gene therapy? So what, you would give people the right interferon allele to help them clear it? Yeah. I suppose you could, but right, that's a more long-term goal and you know, there haven't been any cl clinical trials to do that yet. It would be 10 years before that could come to the clinic. So the antivirals are probably I mean, if you could give everyone antivirals cheaply, it would, it would eradicate the virus because you get rid of the reservoirs. There's no animal reservoir. It's just a human infection. You could definitely get rid of it. But yes, that would be a reasonable approach to, uh, to gene therapy. Which are shared features of persistent infections with polyoma virus, HBV, and HCV? Right, the jokers came back. <laughs> All right, so I didn't make this clear, I suppose. Uh, the answer is virions are produced in all cases. HBV, polyomavirus, HCV, virions are produced during the persistent infection. So one would be wrong because to make a virion, the genome has to be expressed. 
Uh, they don't all cause liver damage. Not all the polyomas cause liver damage. Kidney damage, not all of them. Uh, it's not all of the above. So virions are produced. This is, the, this is the typical pattern that I want you to understand for these viruses. Measles might be part of this, but again, we don't see any infectious virus. So if virions are produced, they're not virions. They're non-infectious particles. OK, so now we'll talk about what are called latent infections, herpes simplex in particular, because for herpes simplex one and two, the, the genome is present but barely expressed. As you will see, some of the other herpes viruses differ slightly. But this, this term latent has come to mean having a genome around but not making virus. And again, I don't care about the terminology. I think persistence is fine to describe all of these. So viral gene products that allow replication are not made or they're found in low concentrations. Um, again, to get this kind of situation, you can't have these cells eliminated by the immune system. And the whole key, the whole point of this is to spread infection. As you will see, these viruses that we're going to, these herpes viruses that we'll talk about hide in certain kinds of cells, that would be a dead end if they couldn't reactivate, make infectious virus, and be transmitted to a new host. If the strategy for persistence was simply to stay in you for your lifetime, that wouldn't be very good because the virus, of course, its goal is to spread to as many hosts as possible. So we're going to use this term reactivation, and that's going to mean making virus to spread to new hosts. And all of these have different states of the genome, okay? Some of them, the genome doesn't even replicate because the genome is in a uh, um, this shouldn't be dividing, actually. It should be non-dividing cell. Neurons are not dividing. And herpes simplex and VZV, the DNA is in neurons. The DNA doesn't have to replicate because the cell never replicates. In some cases, the DNA is replicating in a dividing cell. And this autonomous is another word for episomal. It's not integrated into the host genome. It's free as an episome or uh, an independent uh, entity, and other herpes viruses that we'll talk about, uh, Epstein-Barr cytomegalovirus um, and Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus, we won't talk about that one, have this feature. He hepatitis B is also uh, present as a episomal DNA uh, in dividing cells, and others integrate into the host chromosome and replicate with the host. And we'll talk about it, human herpes virus 6 whose genome appears to integrate. It's the only herpes virus that seems to do that. And every time the genome DNA replicates, the viral DNA genome replicates as well. So it's a good way to achieve persistence. So let's start with herpes simplex viruses. So this is a big family of large DNA containing viruses. The family is herpes viridae. And then the genera, there are many genera, and this is one herpes simplex virus. And here's the, the virus particle. We've talked about this before. In terms of transcriptional regulation, transcriptional cascades, they have a very regulated program of making mRNAs. Uh, they have an icosahedral capsid surrounding the double-stranded DNA genome. It's a very big genome and codes a lot of proteins. It's enveloped. Uh, and then there are lots of proteins between the envelope and the capsid that have important functions. We'll, we'll, uh, we've talked about one of them, actually, which is a transcriptional activator. Over 80% of people in the U.S. are seropositive for herpes simplex viruses. There are two of them, one or two. Over 80% of you are seropositive, and you have genomes in your peripheral nervous system. So in your peripheral ganglia, that means neurons outside of the brain and spinal cord. There are lots of them throughout our bodies. You have herpes simplex genomes in them. Uh, and 40 million Americans every year experience uh, herpes disease in the form of cold sores or blisters that can be uh, in the mouth or in the genital region. And many people do not even experience disease. They shed virus without any symptoms. And this is why the virus is so good at spreading. So if someone has oral herpes lesions, they're not likely, but they shouldn't be spreading disease, all right? Um, but if you have no lesions whatsoever and you are shedding virus, you will unknowingly shed disease. And many mothers, many pregnant mothers, are shedding virus in the cervix and they infect their babies at birth. So this is 80% of babies that are born are infected this way with herpes simplex viruses. 
So a really sneaky pathogen. It's a well-adapted pathogen. It doesn't cause a lot of, of disease and, and replicates really well uh, in its host. And last time we talked about, or two, three lectures ago, we talked about mutations that confer the, the sensitivity to herpes encephalitis. So sometimes the virus gets into the brain where it wreaks havoc. And these are in people with defects in uh, toll-like receptors in the whole sensing pathway. But normally it doesn't go into the brain, probably because there's no way to get out. So here's the schematic of a herpes simplex infection, how it becomes latent and reactivated. So you, you typically get infected at mucosal surfaces. Uh, this can be oral or genital mucosa. Um, and the virus replicates in epithelial cells. Uh, it is released at the basal lateral side of the epithelium. And your mucosal layers are, are innervated. You have sensory uh, and sympathetic nerve endings there. And so here on the left is a sensory nerve ending, you know, the, the nerves that sense pain and heat and so forth. Uh, the viruses are taken up into the nerve ending. So viruses made at the epithelium are taken up into the nerve ending. They travel by axonal transport to the neuron cell body here. And they're typically collections of these from multiple nerve fibers, and that's called a ganglion. So you've got a multiple uh, nerve cells in them. And there, the virus becomes latent. Its genome exists as just a, an episome, and no virus particles are produced. So you have a brief phase of acute infection. So if you're infected as a baby, after birth, you may have a fever or malaise or blisters or any of a variety of symptoms of herpes infection. You may be asymptomatic. Um, but then the virus gets into the sensory neuron. Now, you do have an immune response during all of this. You, in fact, eliminate most of the viruses and virus-infected cells. But again, when the virus gets into the neuron, it is not eliminated. We don't want to eliminate our infected neurons, so the virus escapes by getting in there. It can be eliminated from the epithelial cells, but it hides in the neuron. Uh, same thing can happen at sympathetic ganglia. Here, that's shown here. Same process, virus enters the nerve ending, makes its way to the cell body in the ganglion, and the DNA remains there in a persistently infected state. Now, you'll see in a moment that from time to time, these silent genomes are reactivated. They start to replicate and produce proteins, and virus particles are released uh, at the epithelial surface, and that gives you the, the cold sores, the blistering, and that's how you spread virus to someone else or you may not have any blisters and still spread it because you're shedding virus. But occasionally the virus goes the wrong way. It goes towards the CNS, very rare, but that is when you get the herpes encephalitis. Uh, so here is a cartoon of that event. Here we have our epithelial layer. The virus has replicated and entered the nerve terminus. Now we have the episomal viral DNA uh, in the nucleus. And you should ignore this little hand here. That, that's not related to the pathogenesis. So the genome is silent in the nucleus, is coated with nucleosome. All the transcription is turned off, with the exception of a couple of things we'll tell, talk about in a moment. Uh, there are usually multiple copies of DNA, but it doesn't have to replicate because these cells don't divide. So the DNA, the viral DNA, doesn't have to divide. A couple of copies per nucleus, and they stay there forever. You each have uh, some copies of herpes DNA in your nuclei of your ganglia either up in your head region, typical ones are the trigeminal ganglia on either side of your face here. And when they reactivate, that's how you get the, the fever blisters that can also reside in ganglia lower down in the body. Um, and so these DNAs are there forever. Herpes is forever. Unlike, as my, my, <laughs> my colleague uh, who Saul Silverstein used to teach in this course, he worked on herpes all his life, and he at this point would show a slide that says, unlike love, herpes is forever. <laughs> but I'd, I tried to get it, but I couldn't find that slide. And we have drugs, we have a vaccine, but if you're latently infected, we can't get rid of it because the DNA is always in the neuron. And we don't even know when the DNA starts to replicate and produce virus particles. We don't know if the neuron is killed or not. We, we have no idea because it's very hard to study people. Um, so um, if you could, that's why probably that drugs do not cure the infection. Now, during this latent period or this persistent infection, there's only a couple of RNAs made. There's one called LAT, which is latency-associated transcript, and a bunch of microRNAs are made. The LATs are not translated. No proteins are made. So it's just RNA, 
and we don't really understand its function, but it seems to be important to maintain latency. The, the microRNAs are thought to help maintain the viral genome in its latent state by inhibiting cellular genes, but uh, we really don't know how that works. And there must also be a host contribution to latency. Um, there are probably host genes that are helping to maintain this DNA uh, in that latent state. So periodically, as I said, this virus has to be reactivated, so the virus can be spread to other hosts. That's why viruses exist, to spread to other hosts. And what happens is very small numbers of neurons in each ganglia reactivate. So you can have multiple neurons in a single ganglia that contain viral DNA. A few, a few of those reactivate, they make virus. Virus is assembled in the neuronal cell body, probably doesn't kill it. A virus moves by anterograde transport, is released at the nerve terminus, infects the epithelium and is, in, and is shed. If this is in your mouth, it's shed into saliva, and then you spread it to other people. And as I said, not every reactivation, which is what this process has caused, causes disease. So you can spread virus unknowingly. Um, and when you get blisters, they are in the area innervated by the latently infected ganglia. And the immune response eventually kicks in, but it's too slow to prevent shedding. By the time you have reactivation and virus produced here, it's too late. And then eventually the immune response will, kill, will suppress infection, but by then you've already spread the virus. Now some people, interestingly, reactivate every two to three weeks. And studies have been done showing that people can shed virus every two to three weeks without symptoms or with blisters, and other people never reactivate. And we really don't understand this at all. Triggers of reactivation are well known, include sunburn, stress, nerve damage, so people having an exam will get cold sores uh, and various other things. We don't know how these lead to reactivation. This is a total black box, but they do stimulate viral proteins that you need to start the replication pro program. And if you remember, uh, when herpes viruses infect cells, the genome is shown here. The immediate early promoter has to be activated by a viral protein, VP16, that's brought in uh, to the cell by, in the capsid, and those immediate early proteins include 4 and 0. Uh, in experimental models for latency, if you just pr put ICP0 in, you can get the genome to replicate. But other people feel that the latent genome suddenly begins to produce VP16, and that's what causes reactivation. So we really don't understand this. All we know is that you have to get a transcriptional program going. It's a cascade regulation, if you remember. These stresses cause it, but how they do so, anybody's guess. Next question is, persistence of herpes simplex virus in nerve ganglia requires which of the following? <laughs> now, all over, huh? except for four. OK, so the four is right. Persistence doesn't require UV light stress. That's, that's what reactivates the virus to spread to a new host. Persistence requires silencing of all genes except Latin microRNA, all right? There's no continuous replication. Remember, neurons don't divide, so the viral DNA doesn't have to divide. It just stays there in the, in the neuronal cell. There's no low-level production of virions, and of course, the stress is for reactivation. So number three uh, is the correct answer. Epstein-Barr virus is another herpes virus that causes lifelong persistent infections. 95% of you are seropositive. Actually, you are probably not the proper. You're slightly less seropositive. Um, a lot of kids are infected at birth, but not everybody. But then the next major infecting event is college. And studies have been done that show that EBV is transmitted to many, many uh, uninfected individuals during the college years. And the genome resides in B lymphocytes, the cells that uh, give rise to antibody-producing cells. Most of the infections are asymptomatic, but um, you can get some diseases from this infection. A well-known one is infectious mononucleosis. This is typically your first encounter with Epstein-Barr virus. You can get it, again, as a very young child or in college, and this makes you really tired for a couple of weeks because of this huge cytokine response that the host makes against infection, trying to clear the infection, which it does very well, but for some reason, the particular blend of cytokines produced uh, gives you a lot of fatigue, hence uh, the, the typical symptom of infectious mono. It also causes a number of human cancers of B cells, um, Hodgkin's nasopharyngeal and Burkitt's lymphoma. And it's, again, a herpes virus much like uh, herpes simplex in its structure. Again, this virus infects mucosal epithelial, particularly the mouth 
it's released in the saliva and transmitted by respiratory secretion. So here, primary infection of the virus uh, is infecting epithelial, the oral cavity, for example, or the upper respiratory tract. And it infects these epithelial cells. It's released at the basal lateral level and then infects any resting B cells that happen to be present uh, in this sub-epidermal sub space. The B cells, of course, uh, are going to go elsewhere. And so this one is infected and it goes into the blood. And then, of course, if you get an immune response against uh, the infected cells, and quite a few cells can be infected, you get CTLs and natural killers, and this causes the symptoms of uh, infectious mononucleosis. Now, in order for a B cell to become a memory B cell, it has to go through somatic mutation, rearrangement of immunoglobulin genes, all of which happens in the lymph node. These infected B cells bypass all of that because uh, two viral proteins, LMP1 and 2, and a couple of small RNAs expressed in the nucleus, these cause the B cell to differentiate into a memory B cell. And that's amazing because memory B cells are long-lived. They go to your bone marrow and lymphoid organs and they stay there forever because they're there for you to respond to an infection by making antibody, right? The memory response. So the virus has evolved to get into a B cell, make it differentiate into a memory B cell, and it lasts forever. That's why this virus persists in you. And then periodically, these latently infected memory B cells, it can be you know, in lymphoid tissue, it can be in the bone marrow, some, for some reason that we don't understand, they reactivate and start to make virus, okay? Again, this has to reactivate, this has to make virus. Uh, and most of those virus-producing cells are killed by the immune response, but a few of them get out to sub-epithelial cells, and if they release virions, those virions will infect the epithelium and be shed into the saliva, and that's how you transmit it. And you're typically asymptomatic when this happens. So you just don't know when you're getting EBV, just like you, you might not know when you're getting herpes viruses. So really a brilliant strategy for latency using B cells. So the viral DNA is an episome in the nucleus uh, and it's self-replicating, so the memory cells don't have to replicate. So you remember that um, in, uh, in, in B cells that don't replicate very much, the origin of replication is one that only fires once per cell division. We talked about that some time ago. It makes a few more genes, it expresses a few more genes than herpes viruses, but they're still limited compared to the whole genome. As I said, the B cells uh, go to the bone marrow and lymphoid organs, uh, and they're not killed unless they reactivate and start to make new virus. So when they reactivate and make virus, they can be killed, but a few of them get to mucosal layers and they can release virus. Uh, when B cells divide, the, the episomal viral DNA has to replicate. Remember, the genome has two origins. It has the orelytic, which is used for lytic replication when the B cells or the epithelial cells are being infected at high copy number. And then when the virus is in latently infected memory B cells, it switches to the low copy number origin, where that origin fires once per cell division. So that's, now you understand why I told you about those two origins uh, a long time ago, because they control uh, how the virus replicates in productively infected versus latently infected cells. Uh, we have two more herpes viruses to talk about. Another one is varicella zoster virus, VZV. Again, a very large herpes virus, just like the other ones we're talking about with big double-stranded DNA genomes. Uh, when, this is acquired by respiratory secretions, uh, enters the upper respiratory tract, uh, multiplies in the mucosal epithelium, and then goes into the T cells, which are present in lymphoid organs like the tonsils in the upper tract. T cells get into the blood and they bring the virus to the skin where the virus replicates and causes the typical rash of chicken pox. So chicken pox or varicella is the childhood <laughs> manifestation of, of infection with this virus. It's a very uh, painful blistering rash over the entire body. And when I was a kid, all kids in school used to get chicken pox and would stay home from school because these have virus in them and they can spread virus as well as you're coughing out and sneezing out virus to other children. Now we have a vaccine that completely prevents this. However, after replicating in the skin, this is the acute infection, the virus goes into nerve endings, uh, in this case, uh, sensory nerve endings, uh, 
and makes its way to the ganglia where it becomes latent, just like herpes simplex does in, gla in ganglia. Uh, and this, can, this virus can go into many, many different ganglia, different parts of your body, remains latent there for years, and then it reactivates at some point, and then you get a disease called herpes zoster or shingles. So that's what zoster looks like. So if you've had chickenpox as a kid, you're likely to get this as an, old, an adult usually over 50 years old. And depending on where the virus went latent, in which ganglia, you can have these on your, on your chest, you can have them on your face or on your legs or arms. It can be anywhere. And it's typically one, it's called a dermatome, which is one segment of the flesh that is innervated by this particular uh, ganglia that contains viral genome. So not every ganglia is blatantly infected, just a particular one. 99% uh, of adults used to be infected before we uh, had the vaccine. So now we have a lot of adults getting shingles. 30% develop shingles. Uh, and two thirds of them are over 50 years of age. We don't really know why that is. Uh, the DNA is latent in these ganglia as episomal DNA, two to nine genomes in about one to 7% of the neurons and it doesn't replicate. Uh, there are very few viral genes produced. Uh, there's a couple of them here. Uh, so a little bit different from herpes simplex, and we don't understand what triggers reactivation, why you get shingles. It just pops up out of nowhere, and no, no one has figured out. It's not sunlight, it's not UV, it's not stress, it's not all of the things that cause herpes reactivation. Cytomegalovirus is another one, high seroprevalence. This is why at the beginning of the course, the first lecture, I said you all have three or four herpes viruses. You can see the seroprevalence is very high. This one is transmitted uh, by respiratory routes. It's, it infects cells of the mouth, but also by urine. It infects cells uh, in the kidney and by sexual transmission, also at birth. Replicates in peripheral blood cells and also in cells that make up blood vessels. So here is the seropositivity of uh, individuals to CMV with age from uh, 14 years of age to 75 plus. You can see the seropositivity increases to over uh, 90%. So again, this is something transmitted very readily because the infections are inapparent. Uh, we shed virus for years. After you first get infected, you can get infected at birth or shortly thereafter, you shed virus for years. Eventually, the cellular response resolves the infection. You may not have any signs of the initial infection, but the virus becomes latent in myeloid cells, which are precursors of all these immune cells, and those are in the bone marrow. And periodically they reactivate and you shed virus in the saliva or urine and you spread it to someone else. If you are pregnant, this is really bad because if you are pregnant and you shed virus and you infect the fetus, there's a very high chance that the fetus will have congenital abnormalities. So this is why uh, it's really important to be um, careful about sh being, shedding virus during pregnancy. Um, also a problem with organ transplantation because you have this latent virus in you. If you get an organ transplant, you're immunosuppressed. The virus replicates and can cause uh, a variety of damage. So this is becoming a huge problem uh, in organ transplant because it's over 99% of the population. Virtually every organ donor is gonna have this. So the reactivation and problems is a reality in, in organ transplantation. Uh, what do persistent infections with EBV, VZV, and CMV have uh, in common? Epstein-Barr virus, varicella zoster, and cytomegalovirus. Good, number three is the right answer. B cells are essential for latent infection. It applies only to Epstein-Barr virus. Birth defects has to do with CMV. The others may be present, particularly herpes viruses can infect the newborn, but it doesn't cause birth defects. Viral DNA persists as an episome. That's the correct answer. The factors governing reactivation are well known. We know what reactivates simplex, but we're not sure what reactivates EBV or CMV. We know very little, and part of the problem is no good uh, animal models for these infections. Uh, the last two viruses are herpes viruses, six and seven, and these are viruses that cause a mild childhood rash. You can see this child here has this rather mild rash, not anywhere near as painful as, say, chicken pox. Um, it's called sixth disease. There are five other rash diseases uh, that were discovered before it, or exanthem subito. It's a herpes virus, just like all the others. We've talked about everybody. Again, 85% or more adults are seropositive, have been infected. And typically, 
you get infected through respiratory secretions parent to child. So at or shortly after birth, you know, you're kissing your child and you're shedding virus, you're infecting, you're giving your child the gift of herpes virus uh, infections. <laughs> Infects a number of cell types, lymphoid cells, epithelial, endothelial, liver, CNS, and salivary cells. So there's potential for this being shed at various parts of the body. And like the other herpes viruses, uh, it remains latent for your lifetime. And there are periods where virus is produced and periods where virus is not produced. We really don't understand this very well, but a number of years ago, not too long ago, it was found that the virus in, uh, in, a certain, in the people that have been studied anyway, integrates into telomeres. So you know that the ends of human chromosomes have these repeated sequences called telomeres that are maintained by an enzyme called telomerase. And this is so the ends of the DNA doesn't get lost during DNA replication. Well, the ends of the viral DNA, which are shown here, also have these telomere-like sequences, the red lines. And the, the, in, in individuals, it can be found that uh, the viral DNA is integrated into the telomere of the host cell. So here is the end of the chromosome, and you can see this viral genome is integrated right at the end, so it's an extension uh, of the chromosomal DNA. So, this may happen in, in everyone and may be one way that latency is maintained. In about 1% uh, of the people who have been studied, this is actually integrated into the germline DNA. So it is passed on from parent to child, the HHV6 genome. It's about 1% of all people it goes in the germline. And the rest of the integration is probably at non-germline cells. So it's thought that this is how this virus remains latent, how it causes a lifelong persistent infection. It integrates into your DNA. If it just integrated into some DNA in your cell, that would be fine as long as that were a long-lived cell. We don't know yet because we haven't studied it much. But of course, if you integrate into a germline, you pass it on to your children, and they have it forever. Their whole offspring line from their children to their children, et cetera, et cetera, will always have uh, this viral DNA. So a very interesting way to uh, explain latency and transmission. But I've given you the information in a gradient of our understanding from the herpes viruses the most to this virus, which is the least. And this uh, requires a lot of study. So I want to end up with this slide, which is the estimated burden of chronic or persistent viral infections in humans. So these are different viruses and how many people are estimated to be infected. This is a log scale, right? 10, 100, 1,000. These are in actually this is 10 million, uh, 100 million, 1,000 million, and so forth. So the, the whole world's population of humans is infected with endogenous retrovirus. We each have 8% of our genome. So this is everybody. So most of these viruses, look at how many people they infect. Uh, HHV7, 6, VZV, EBV, CMV, and the herpes viruses, you can see they're all way up there in terms of prevalence. And number two is this one here, anelovirus. These are these little single-stranded DNA viruses that are in our blood supply and that infect everyone. So that's quite remarkable. And by comparison, um, let's see, where is HIV-1 is down here, quite low. So most of the world is infected with these persistently, latently infecting DNA viruses. They're really good at remaining quiet and they're really good at spreading. And I think they're also candidates for perhaps having some uh, beneficial effects. <clears throat>